Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Tom. Um, I like I really appreciate the fact that you know God puts it on people's hearts for things to happen. You know, sometimes we strive to make things happen, but when the Lord makes it happen, it actually happens with His grace on it. And uh, it's a trust issue. It really is. And that's trust on both sides. It's trust from leadership, the trust the witness of the Spirit, and it's also trust of the recipient, the invitation. Isn't that cool? And um, I'm thankful to be here. And I think, Neil, you mentioned I could... Um, Friday night, this Friday night, we last Friday night, just gone, we started some dream interpretation. And so I've been an avid dreamer for 11 years. The Lord sovereignly turned that gift up on my life and it hasn't stopped every day of my life. So we're going through dream interpretation. Um, I'm assuming people were blessed. Put your hand up if you're blessed by... Yep, just two people, three people. Okay. It made sense. Dreams sometimes can be abstract, but God's actually speaking to the individual if they can actually understand what the symbols are saying to them and put it in context. Otherwise, it's pie in the sky instead of steak on the plate. Saturday morning as well, this one coming, um, I'm doing Game Changer Intensive. Um, usually it's $20 per person each time I go. They get a booklet as well, but I've decided that once you pay for the booklet $20, you can come along for free. Okay? And my heart is to trust God. If you feel it on your heart to bless my life because of the ministry, you bless me. But if you don't feel it, there's no obligation. I'm serving Jesus. And I want people to do this with ownership. And um, what is Game Changer Intensive? Game Changer Intensive is what I worked out in the process of my pain, my trauma, my past, and how scripturally, in context, how we can move past those things in our life. Okay, so I'm qualified by grace. Is everyone okay this morning? Okay. Well, let's get into it. Um, there were some verses, but um, we couldn't get them up on the board. I'm not usually a structured person, um, but I thought I'd bring a bit of st structure this morning. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> bring a bit of structure. <laughs> Structure keeps me on track, apparently. That's what my sister told me. First, before I begin, I want people here that don't know me to understand that the journey for me has been a big one. By the age of 19, I was in seven drug-induced comas. Sexually abused, mentally abused, physically abused, stepfather in and out of prison, violently bashing my mother. I literally lived in this world with not one iota of hope. And you'd think even with Christ coming into my life that it would all be dandy and fine. Because apparently we're complete in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. And that was the case. In the realm of the spirit, I was born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again, born in spirit. Not physically, born in spirit. And so for myself, a lot of my journey didn't make sense. Because I was told that I could do all things through Christ in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I was told that I was more than a conqueror, yet I was barely getting by. Come on, who's been on barely get by street? <laughs> so I was hearing the message, but I wasn't understanding how to get to the completion of what God said about me. So I hope just by giving this as a preamble that I can set this up for you to be more receptive, that I'm not talking out of school. I'm living what I'm preaching. I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol. I don't go to strippers anymore. I don't go to brothels like I used to. I don't gamble. Picked up a gambling addiction at the age of 32. Prior to coming back to Christ, I was circling shops to do armed robberies. I made a balaclava out of my hooded jumper, cut the eyes and the mouth out, with a hammer on the street. 
about to take someone hostage before I come back to Jesus in 2011. Someone give Jesus all the glory. Jesus can heal and bring someone out of utter darkness no matter what complications, what limitations, what restrictions, what, what any generational curses has been placed upon you. My name is Aboriginal, my pop's German, and other butter peanut butter sandwiches, here I am. Wait, look, this guy looks interesting. I can't quite tell his nationality. <laughs> well, it says we're a peculiar people, doesn't it? <laughs> we're a royal priesthood. I look like a priest, don't I? <laughs> Come on, hey, you're allowed to laugh in church. You know, I found out that God actually does have a sense of humour. I know because I'm looking at you, right? I know he's got a sense of humour. Trust me, what I'm looking at, I can tell God had created people the way he did because he is creative. My auntie, right there, she's lost two husbands or two men, left with three children. Only recently, her husband died of cancer. Only recently, the other one hung himself before he was going to come to church. You know what I love about my auntie? My auntie had Jesus speaking to her while she was on methamphetamines. My auntie ended up in the mental ward, ringing me up asking about the book of James. And I thought, here we go. One of those moments, they're fizzling out, they're getting all weird, they want to get all spiritual. How many years later now, honey? Seven years, she has not gone back to drugs. She still continued on with Jesus when her man hung himself the day he was meant to go to church and she's still serving Jesus. My sister next to her lived a pretty good life. It wasn't as damaged as mine. She was resistant of the church because she thought it was boring, it was in wasn't really for her. But she was in a relationship and she had a dream and she came out to me and said, Mark, what does this dream mean? And I gave the interpretation. She didn't believe it. She said, no, that's not of God. I don't care. I don't believe in it. One month later or two months later, the dream come to pass and it rocked her so hardcore to her heart. She walked out of the room and said, obviously God's speaking to me. My way doesn't work. She says, I need to give my life to Jesus. What am I doing? I'm stirring you a bit. Sometimes the church needs a bit of waking up. Come on, because you sit here every week going through the motions. I'm here to stir you up. I'm here to prick you awake. Let's get our heart back to Jesus. While we sit here and warm the seats every weekend, we need stories like this to know that we can do something radical and believe the radical and expect the radical and not just live for the mundane, to believe in the supernatural power of God. See, my first introduction to the Bible, now you might be saying, well, what are you telling me all your story today? Look, I'm going to preach in a second. But what's the point of me preaching, thinking, who's this guy? I'm telling you who I am and what I was to help you understand about what I'm about to give you. My first introduction to the Bible was in a unit in Broken Hill. My step-uncle, me and him were on amphetamines. And he pulls out the Bible high as a kite. Not on Jesus. And he's preaching the gospel to me. What's your introduction to the Bible? <laughs> Anyone had an encounter like that? He went to Sydney. I went to Sydney. And he started telling me, John 3, 3, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again, Mark. John 3, 5, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. And he said, John 3, 16 says, God so 
love this world. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So he didn't come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And something inside of me said, I want what that man has. And I rode back on my deadly treadly. If you don't know what a deadly treadly is, that's um, a push bike for Aboriginal. <laughs> so I rode back on my deadly treadly. And I got the Bible, which I didn't really want to read. Have you felt like that before? And I opened the book of Palms. <laughs> Anyone open to the Book of Palms before? <laughs> I thought it was the Book of Palms. I found out later it was the Book of Psalms. <laughs> True story. I thought it was the Book of Palms. <laughs> and I remember... <laughs> I was in chapter 72. And you got to understand I was uneducated. Didn't like reading. I don't think I ever read a book in my life up to the age of 19. Porn mags, pornos. I'd read anything but, or just look at pictures. Durbrain. Spirit of stupor. But I wanted what that man had. So as I'm reading in chapter 72 as best as I could, I'm going down the page, and I don't even know why I turned to the book of Psalms. But before my eyes could glance on verse 14, a face up in my face looked at me face to face and spoke the verse to me. I felt his spirit eyes on my eyes. I felt his face up in my face. And I felt his spirit speak directly to my spirit. He said, I'm going to rescue you from oppression, violence, and fraud. He said, because your blood is precious in my eyes. No one from that point ever got me to a Bible study group by coercing me any longer. I made a decision that I had the truth speak to me. And then I picked up the Bible like I picked up no other drug. And I consumed myself with the word of God. Now, you may say, well, why doesn't God do that to me? I don't know. Maybe I needed it because I was not getting it. Maybe I needed that extra grace. Maybe I needed mercy. Maybe I needed help. Hallelujah. What's your name, the guy there? Yeah, God's called you into the supernatural, into the realm of the spirit. You don't like shallows. And your frustration is, how do I get from where I am here with culture to where God, you've placed me in the spirit. And God says, instead of waiting on something to come to you, why don't you wait upon me? For I'm about to show you great and mighty things. Your day of visitation is coming, my son. I've seen the cry of your heart. I've seen your meditation. I've seen your desperation. I'm about to turn the volume up in your life. I'm removing the boredom out of your soul. I'm moving the obligation out of you and the business of your life. And from here on in, it's business between me and you. I'm bringing you back to your first love. That hot, fiery love where Jesus is everything and everything else is nothing. So I thank you for encouraging, Lord, and I also see that the Lord's going to restore unto you the joy of your salvation. Heaviness has come on you at times. Burdens have come on you at times. And God says, I haven't given you that spirit. I gave you the spirit of praise. Now start praising me like there's no tomorrow. You start worshipping me in spirit and truth. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Consider it pure joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing patience, and patience is going to have its thorough work, that you may be thoroughly equipped, mature. And I see God saying, what I'm about to birth in you is going to be released in revival. Great power, great authority is coming out of your spirit. Your time is coming. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but the Lord says a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Bless my brother in Christ, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, let's get back to the message. Now, if you want a Bible reference, hallelujah. So let's go to Proverbs. Chapter 15, verse 4. It says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. You know, it says, like a muddied well and a polluted spring is like a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. Do you know, you can allow things to get on the inside of your heart. Even though Jesus has made your heart brand new, things can still get in your heart. Proverbs 18.21 says, life and death is in the power of your tongue. That's why your tongue was meant to be wholesome. It means to have a healing tongue, to have a life-giving tongue. That's why it says that a fool's words is his undoing. It's a snare to his soul because your tongue has power to set you free. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. And so when we talk from the old, God is hindered and restricted in creating the new in your spirit. Come on. He fills your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You're filled with the fruit of your lips. Our words cause our spirit to go in the direction that God wants us to go in. Who's ever met a person that's spiritually charged and consistent that always complains? Who's ever met a depressed person that praises Jesus when they feel down? Where's the God of all hope when you're grieving? Because we should not grieve as those that don't have hope. Christians should not despair because we have the God of all hope, the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, the God of all power, the God of all grace, the God of all mercy, the God that is consistent in every inconsistency that comes towards our way. Knowing this, that he's working all things together for good, because we love him and we're called according to his purpose. It says in verse 13, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I believe that we get so caught up in our emotion that our mind gravitates to our emotions so strongly that it's near impossible to praise God unless someone wakes us up out of it. Another way of saying it is we feel sorry for ourselves. Another way of saying it is no one understands what I'm going through. Another way of saying it is no one understands. And then we say the devil's been attacking me. And the Lord gave me revelation about the devil's attacking me all the time. He said, so since when are you meant to be on the back foot? Since when is the devil meant to be bigger than God in your storms? Since when do you praise him more than me? Who is the greatest spirit? Who is the king of kings and lord of lords? Who is the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end? Come on, man. It's Lord Jesus or it's Lord Feelings. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I won't give you too many more verses. I, I, can, I can test your spirit. You say, how can I test it? How much truth you can take? How much truth can you take? Because it's a level of your freedom right now. Truth was never meant to hurt you. Come on, man. Truth was never designed to hurt anyone. Well, the truth hurts. No, it hurts your shame. It hurts your rejection. It hurts what you're holding on to. It was never meant to hurt you. It was to set you free. Come on, man. Here the sun sets, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall... But the truth has to break away and snap off and remove the things that you hold on to. Hallelujah. Just one person's happy with that. Why are you preaching out of the book of Proverbs? Um, because it means to sk live skillfully. Break it in half, proverbs. You can pro at verbs. I want to be a pro at doing because I don't want to be a hearer of the word because those who do it will be blessed. <laughs> I want to step into the blessing. <laughs> this word proverb also means to rule, reign and have dominion. So I'm going to dig into the truth. I'm going to work out what the Lord wants me to understand. I won't continue on with this message because there's so much and I don't want to be soul-driven. But I do want to get my point across. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 14 says, the spirit of a man can sustain him in sickness. The Passion Translation says the will of a man can get him through the sickness. You fight, don't you, when you're sick? You've got cancer, you've got diabetes, you've got headaches. It doesn't matter what it is, you fight. I'm not allowing this thing to overcome me. But King Solomon said, who can bear a broken spirit? The word bear means who can lift it up, who can carry it? The word broken spirit means a smitten, crushed, wounded spirit. One that's easily angered and one that slips into depression. It's the spirit inside of you that doesn't give itself to Jesus because that broken spirit is a spirit that's entrapped by sin. But because Christ has become your new creation spirit, you can now place your spirit in him and he grows you up in all things. And that means you can handle more pain. See, I thought when I became a Christian, I thought it was like, Jesus, you're going to remove all my pain. I, I got told that once you come to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Anyone, did you get told that? That's what I got told. When I gave my heart to Jesus, it got worse. It got good, but it got worse. Because now instead of punching someone, I had to be patient with them. True story. I'd punch you just looking at you. If you looked at me the wrong way, I'd punch you. And now I give my heart to Jesus. And I've got someone mouthing off at me, and I've got this mindset saying, if they just understood who I was in my thinking. So I had to learn to die, and the pain amplified. What am I trying to say? If you want to be free... Make pain your friend. Oh no, I avoid pain. That's your problem. Paul said, I take pleasure. I take pleasure. My mind says I'm okay when I'm in pain now. My mind says that Jesus is Lord when I'm in pain. Trials are compulsory, guys. Jesus said you're going to have trouble. And so the more we avoid pain, we're avoiding our victory. 
And so now every day I'm training my thinking to tell myself that I'm okay in the pain and that's the normal journey for me. So that when I am persecuted, when I am falsely accused, when things go wrong, when trials come, my spirit is anchored by my thinking that says everything's going to work together for good. It's not anchored in the pain. And we see so many people today bound up with anxiety. They have social phobias. Why, why can't they go to the mall? Because their mind is welded to their emotion. And now they become self-referential. They base everything off their feelings instead of the truth. Yet when we look at the life of Jesus, it says that Satan came, but he had nothing in me. And I believe the truth wants to get so concentrated inside of us that Satan has nothing in us. Because the wilderness in the Hebrew means the place of the word. And when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4.4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he was tempted to chuck himself off the pinnacle. He said, if you chuck yourself down, God's going to send his angels to guard you so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. And he pulled out the word of God again in his weakest point and said, do not test the Lord thy God. Then the third time he said, if you will bow down and worship me, all the glory in the cities thereof, I'll give it to you. And he says, the Bible says, you worship and serve the Lord thy God and you serve him only. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're feeling nervous, if you're feeling challenged right now, good. You know why pastors are burning out overseas? Because they're people pleasers. They're trying to keep everyone happy. They were never meant to. The Lord spoke to me a few years ago. He said he's going to heal me from men pleasing. Well, how do you know if you've got the men pleasing? How do you, how do you know? Because you fear men. You're so worried about what they think when you say something that you're caught up so you please them instead of telling the truth in love. Because we're, sometimes we're building our kingdom, aren't we? But he said to me, I'm going to heal you of man pleasing. It's about time we stop placing all our worth and value in someone else's hands. We place it in Jesus. It's not about our successes and, and what we're achieving. It's actually about what we're becoming. Let me tell you, you might have a yacht right now. You may have a mansion. You may be in the gutter. But the only thing you're taking to heaven is your character. Where's your character right now? The only thing I'm taking is my character. So really, what's more important right now? Well, look at all I've done for you, Lord. He says, no, what are you becoming, son and daughter? Not what you're doing, what are you becoming? What are you going to present to me on that day when I say, well done? Is it going to be burnt up? Or is the fire going to burn in you and get rid of whatever needs to get out of the way for God to do what he needs to do? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Spirit of God. Thank you for touching people. Thank you for coming, Lord Jesus, because you love your people. And thank you that people would stop being so enamored with you loving them, that they would realize that we need to start loving you. Sometimes we say sorry, Lord Jesus, because we feel sorry for ourselves, not because we're grieving your heart.
our whole concept of Father God. <laughs> to think that we're sitting here saying sorry, but really we're sorry for ourselves because we keep making mistakes. And God says, have you ever considered that you're actually grieving me when you do these things? That changes everything. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I couldn't, I can continue to go, but it's been a big day. Um, my heart is for all ears. I care about you all. But um, we've got to live in the natural too, don't we? That was wonderful. Amen. How many people enjoyed that today? Amen. How many people enjoyed his giggle? Hey, how does he do that? What an amazing giggle he's got. But he's, you know, we're, got, we're going to dismiss and thanks so much. Be blessed. Have a fantastic week.